Well, good morning. It is May the 17th, Tuesday, and we, I, I left my uh, patio door open because the bird sounds and the sounds of a beautiful, almost summer, but late spring day are just so beautiful and everything is kind of picture perfect today. So I want to enjoy it to the max while it's here and the sounds of the birds are wonderful. So I hope everyone is having a good day. Uh, yesterday I watched a little bit more news than I typically do and I realized watching the, watching news there's so much stuff without even getting out of our own country. There are so many things and um, shootings and things, uh, senseless, just senseless things, tragedies happening all over. So um, be careful how much news you take in and ingest. It probably is, if you're, if you're watching a lot of it, and especially watching it, um, because it's so repetitive if you see it anywhere, on YouTube or uh, TV, it is there's there's a lot of senseless tragedy in this world, and we need to know that that's happening. But we don't need to like let that be our full the full meal we take in. We can send loving kindness. We can practice loving kindness with ourselves, always radiating it out. But um, we have to have some ways to deal with the, uh, if we have a constant input of bad news and awful things, it becomes hard to, hard to, to do anything helpful with it. it. It makes it feel like the only choice is to kind of just get back in bed and pull the covers up, right? So be careful, be careful about the news. And I'm not suggesting that any of us be, put, that we be sticking our head in the sand, but be careful about the way you take in news and, uh, and notice how it affects you and make choices about, do I need to see a fifth broadcast today of things going on in the world or do I need to see, maybe it would be better to read some of the news or read news highlights for a while but it's, it will tend to really bring you down. And then what, what good is that, right? It doesn't help us. It's not helping anybody and it's not, uh, it's not helping ourselves. Well, I think uh, something that I'm trying to do more in my day and finding how easily distracted I can get is just reading. So I really enjoy reading with you so we're reading Lama Yeshi, Yeshi Lama Yeshi, uh, his book, Becoming Your Own Therapist. And the book was written in 75, and I think Eva, Eva B. mentioned, I knew he had died, but I wasn't sure. And she said he, uh, I think you said Eva, Eva that he died in 85 or 84 very important teacher in the Tibetan tradition, but his message is very, his, his message and the way he writes is uh, a universal. So we were on page 31, we're in chapter two, and this is called um, Religion, the Path of Inquiry. And it's very interesting. It was a longer chapter, most are a shorter lecture, so. And he talks about how much uh, one of the parag paragraphs we read yesterday began with, consider the materialistic life. It's a state of complete agitation and conflict. I think that's, yeah, 1984 is when he died and he's left quite a legacy behind. Um, so the materialistic life agitation and conflict. You can never fix things the way you want. And the thought that hung with me yesterday was you can't just wake up in the morning and decide exactly how you want your day to unfold. 
Forget about weeks, months, or years. You can't even predetermine one day. So uh, that's was that was that's powerful to think. Just a material life, just materialistic in nature and by design, is going to be full of agitation. So we're we're a page or so ahead of that. <clears throat> And he's just beginning to talk about paths that you can choose to take. And if you've chosen a path and it's not providing solutions to your problems, answers to your questions, satisfaction to your mind, you must check up. Perhaps there's something wrong with your point of view, your understanding. You can't necessarily, I'm reading back a little bit, uh, you can't necessarily conclude that there's something wrong with your religion just because you tried it and it didn't work. So he's, he's recommending that uh, make sure the way you understand your religion's ideas and methods is correct. And he's talking about any religion or spiritual path if you're looking in that direction. If you make the right effort on the basis of right understanding, you will experience deep inner satisfaction. And that's, that's the first uh, step in our Eightfold Path, and the, is right understanding. So he's pulling two of these, if you make right effort on the basis of right understanding, you'll understand the deep, you'll un, you will experience deep inner satisfaction. So that's any, any spiritual path you're on, that's important. It's not just a Buddhist. It just, it's not just true for a Buddhist. It's true for anyone. True satisfaction comes from the mind. That's where we stopped yesterday. We often feel miserable and our world seems upside down <coughs> because we believe that external things will work exactly as we plan and expect them to. We expect things that are changeable by nature not to change, impermanent things to last forever. I think I walked through a spider web outside. Sorry, I'm brushing imaginary spider web off my face. Then when they do change, we get upset. Getting upset when something in your house breaks shows that you didn't really understand it's impermanent nature. When it's time for something to break, it's going to break, no matter what you expect. Nevertheless, we still expect material things to last. Nothing material lasts. It's impossible. Therefore, to find lasting satisfaction, you should put more effort into your spiritual practice and meditation than into manipulating the world around you. That's great. I'm going to read that sentence again. That's, that's one to, to live with. Therefore, to find lasting satisfaction, you should put more effort into your spiritual practice and meditation than into manipulating the world around you. Lasting satisfaction comes from your mind, from within you. Your main problem is your uncontrolled, dissatisfied mind whose nature is suffering. Knowing this, when any problem arises, instead of getting upset because of your unfulfilled expectations and busily distracting yourself with some external activity, relax, sit down, and examine the situation with your own mind. That is much more constructive. That is a much more constructive way of dealing with problems and pacifying your mind. Moreover, when you do this, you allow your innate knowledge wisdom to grow. Remember, knowledge wisdom, he's made a, uh, he's connected that into, he's hyphenated that. Knowledge wisdom. 
Let me read the sentence again. Moreover, when you do this, you allow your innate wisdom, your innate knowledge wisdom to grow. Wisdom can never grow in an agitated, confused, and restless mind. Agitated mental states are a major obstacle to your gaining of wisdom. So too is the misconception that your ego and your mind's nature are one and the same. If that's what you believe, you'll never be able to separate them and reach beyond ego as long as you believe that you are totally in the nature of sin and negativity, you will never be able to transcend them. What you believe is very important and very effectively perpetuates your wrong views. In the West, people seem to think that if you aren't one with your ego, you can't have a life, get a job, or do anything. That's a dangerous delusion you can't separate ego from mind, ego from life. That's your big problem. You think that if you lose your ego, you'll lose your personality, your mind, your human nature. That's simply not true. You shouldn't even worry about that. If you lose your ego, you'll be happy. You should be happy. But of course, this raises the question, what is the ego? In the West, people seem to have so many words for the ego, but do they know what the ego really is? Anyway, it doesn't matter how perfect your English is. The ego is not a word. The word is just a symbol. The actual ego is within you. It's the wrong conception that yourself is independent, permanent, and inherently existent. In reality, what you believe to be I doesn't exist. If I were to ask everybody here to check deeply, beyond words, what they thought the ego was, each person would have a different idea. I'm not joking, this is my experience. You should check your own. We always say very superficially, that's your ego, but we have no idea what the ego really is. Sometimes we even use the term pejoratively. Oh, don't worry, that's just your ego, or something like that. But if you check up more deeply, you'll see that the average person thinks that the ego is his personality, his life. Men feel if they were to lose their ego, They'd lose their personalities. They'd no longer be men. Women feel that were they to lose their ego, they'd lose their female qualities. That's not true, not true at all. Still, based on Westerners' interpretations of life and ego, that's pretty much what it comes down to. They think the ego is something positive in the sense that it's essential for living in society. That if you don't have an ego, you can't mix in society. You check up more deeply on the mental level, not the physical. It's interesting. Even, I think he's advising people to do this, so I'll reread that last sentence. You check up more deeply on the mental level, not the physical. It's interesting. Even more psychologists describe the ego so superficially that you think it was a physical entity. From the Buddhist point of view, the ego is a mental concept, not a physical thing. Of course, symptoms of ego activity can manifest externally, such as when, for example, someone's angry and his face and body reflect that angry vibration. But that's not anger itself, it's a symptom of anger. Similarly, ego is not its external manifestations, but a mental factor, a psychological attitude. You can't see it from the outside. When you meditate, you can see why today you're up, tomorrow you're down, mood swings are caused by your mind. People who don't check within themselves 
come up with very superficial reasons, like, I'm unhappy today because the sun's not shining. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but most of the time, your ups and downs are due to primarily psychological factors. When a strong wind blows, the clouds vanish and blue sky appears. Similarly, when the powerful wisdom that understands the nature of the mind arises, the dark clouds of ego disappear. Beyond the ego, the agitated, uncontrolled mind, lie everlasting peace and satisfaction. So he's saying that the ego is, in fact, our agitated, uncontrolled mind. That's why Lord Buddha prescribed penetrative analysis of both your positive and your negative sides. In particular, when your negative mind arises, instead of being afraid, you should examine it more closely. You see, Buddhism is not at all a tactful religion, always trying to avoid giving offense. Buddhism addresses precisely what you are and what your mind is doing in the here and now. That's what makes it so interesting. You can't expect to hear only positive things. Sure, you have a positive side, but what about the negative aspect of your nature? To gain an equal understanding of both, an understanding of the totality of your being, you have to look at your negative characteristics as well as the positive ones and not try to cover them up. I don't have much more to say right now, but I'll be happy to try to answer some questions. I love how he transitions into the question, the Q&A. And he said quite a lot. He probably just thinks he, people, people can only take so much before he gives them a break. It's, it's, uh, his, his speech is, is simple, but it's very, it's very direct. So let's, we can do one or two questions and then we can sit. Uh, first question is, Lama, were you saying that we should express rather than suppress our negative actions, that we should let the negativity come out? And he answers, it depends. There are two things. If the negative emotion has already bubbled to the surface, it's probably better to express it in some way but it's preferable if you can deal with it before it has reached that level. Of course, if you don't have a method of dealing with strong negative emotions and you try to bottle them up deep inside, eventually that can lead to serious problems, such as an explosion of anger that causes someone to pick up a gun and shoot people. We know this, this is we know so well in this country. What Buddhism teaches is a method of examining that emotion with wisdom and digesting it through meditation, which allows the emotion to simply dissolve. Never once is he saying suppress it. Expressing strong negative emotions externally leaves a tremendously deep impression on your consciousness. This kind of imprint makes it easier for you to react in the same harmful way again, except that the second time it may be even more powerful than the first. That sets up a karmic chain of cause and effect that perpetuates such negative behavior. So when we express those strong emotions externally, we're leaving, we're making a tremendously deep impression on our consciousness. This imprint makes it easier for you to react in the harm, same harmful way again, except that the second time may be even more powerful than the first. And that's what we see over and over again this sets up a karmic chain of cause and effect that perpetuates such negative behavior. Therefore, you have to exercise skill and judgment <clears throat> in dealing with negative energy. Learn when and how to express it 
and, espe and especially know how to recognize it early and digest it with wisdom. So I'll stop there so we can sit. We have a little time to sit together. And our, your sitting can be a step of that digesting. How does he phrase it? Digesting. Digest these things with wisdom. So why don't we just sit, and we have about five minutes to just sit, just relax the body. And stay with the breath, just your normal breath. Allow the body to breathe and just be aware of each inhale and exhale. Just let go. Let go of whatever's weighing you down. Just for right now, just let that go. And if you're staying with your breath, or if you're counting your breath, breaths, you can become aware when you become distracted. You'll lose count or you'll realize you haven't checked your breathing at all. Then just don't be critical of yourself, just Drop whatever distraction you're feeding your attention to and just come back to the breath.
can stay in your meditation mode. And I'd like to read this. Uh, I haven't read this in a long time, but this is a, I think Sylvia Borstein compiled this. And I really like, uh, this is something you can read every day or memorize. Here's a set of intentions based on traditional Buddhist precepts. Some people say them aloud each morning. On behalf of myself and all beings, I want to refrain from consciously hurting anyone. I intend to refrain from overtly or covertly taking what is not mine. mine. I intend to be sure that my speech is kind as well as true. I intend to refrain from addictive behaviors that confuse my mind and lead to heedlessness. And we do this just the same way we send merit every day, by sending it out not only for ourselves, but for all others. So we can repeat it almost again in a different way. May everything we do and say and think today be done not only for our own benefit, but also for the benefit of all sentient beings. So I hope everyone has a good day. And uh, Eva mentions that she, she is posting a link of, the PD, of a PDF of the book. So the book is available as a free PDF. Thanks, Eva. That's great. So have a good day, everyone. And um, so let your speech be gentle but true. And uh, that's by practicing these things. This is how we are doing our part to help change the things in the world that cause us pain and grief and uh, sadness and that agitation and confusion of a materialistic life. Okay.